And welcome into the Rowdy Studios. I'm Bassmasters. That's Buzz Cutler, Reed Spencer of Sporting News in the middle. Talk a little NASCAR, talking a little fuel injection, EFI. What does that stand for, EFI? Electronic fuel injection. So there we go. So explain. Give us the fundamentals. You were at the test yesterday. Give us the fu fundamentals here of EFI. Okay, the fundamentals of ESI are, EFI are pretty simple, uh, except you've got to learn the, the alphabet in order to <laughs> talk about it because you have EFI, you have ECUs, electronic control units, right. et cetera. Um, a, a Essentially, a carburetor, which has been in use in NASCAR since 1949, um, mixes air and fuel. What happens with EFI is that the throttle body, which sits in the same position that a carburetor does on top of the engine, simply is now an air intake, and the fuel is injected into each of the eight cylinders below. So, so it's not mixed and then goes into the engine. It's correct. injected directly into that. So into consequently, you've got, um, you've got more control and you've got more efficiency in terms of fuel flow. And theoretically, that's going to make throttle response better. Um, and it's also going to ultimately save you fuel over the long run. You, you know, we've, we've, we've been talking for years about um, crew chiefs having room to be creative. Now with this fuel injection, you can tune it for power, you can tune it for fuel efficiency. Does this give crew chiefs a little bit more um, influence in terms of how the car runs? Are we going to be able to see differences between cars in a way that perhaps has been lacking over the past couple of well, years? Well, and I, I think absolutely you can. Part of it depends on how many channels NASCAR allows the teams to tap into because you can plug into the ECU, the electronic control unit, after practice or after a race and essentially if NASCAR lets you see all the data you can reconstruct after the fact complete telemetry lap after lap around the racetrack. So even handling information you can get from yes, that? Yes, you, you can get a full range of information. Um, NASCAR, I don't believe, will let crew chiefs and teams tap into every single aspect, every single channel that's available to them, but they will give them a lot more information. And what that also will allow teams to do is map an engine to a particular driver's driving style because, you know, if, mm -hmm. they, run, if they run an engine on a dyno now, and we've, we've been up to Dodge and watch this process, where they will say, okay, here's Kurt Busch at Charlotte, and they will show you you know, where he lifts, where he's on the gas, and that may be completely different from where somebody else um, runs that same car at Charlotte. So the fuel injection actually allows you to match the, um, the fuel flow and the performance of the car to a driving style mm -hmm. in a way that um, carbureted engines do not. So although the engines are different, you could have different torque curves and that kind of thing in a carbureted engine. You Absolutely. can't fine-tune it down to a driver in the same way as you can with a fuel injection. Exactly right. Are the drivers feeling a difference? I know it seemed like Jeff Burton said he didn't think there was much of a difference, but then Casey Kane seemed to say, yeah, there's kind of a difference in the response of the car. I, I think ultimately once they get um, once they get testing and refinements done to fuel injection, there will be a minuscule difference in terms of what drivers feel in terms of the performance of the car. Um, you know, Burton said basically that it was a unique opportunity to compare what he felt on Saturday night versus mm -hmm. what he felt on Monday, and he drove the car into turn one exactly the same way. He was on the throttle in exactly the same way. So, so I don't think performance-wise, or in the sound of the car perceptible to fans, I don't think you're going to see any difference at all. I think the fundamental difference is the way the fuel flow is controlled and the data that will be available to the teams based on that. Is this a, is this a potential game changer? Does, could, th could this change any kind of balance of power thing? Could some team figure it out better than another team and take a leap forward? Is it that have that kind of potential? Well, I, I think th the danger is that the rich get richer. Um, that the teams that have the resources like Hendrick Motorsports are able to use the computer data um, more efficiently than a team that is underfunded and may only buy one or two units and one or two software licenses for the for the ECUs and you know that's another fundamental issue and and that is that it's more expensive. Um, I see. The uh, the fuel injection system is going to run twenty five to twenty seven thousand dollars just in terms of the hardware. And that's per engine? That's that you per build? engine. And mm -hmm. you know now you can transfer it from one to another, but I think most people, at least on the, on the heavily funded teams, are going to have dedicated units per engine. Um, consequently, um, you know, that's, that's about fifteen to 17,000 more 
than a carburetor would cost you to install on a car. So that's an increased expense. Then you're also going to be paying a software license to McLaren, which is going to exceed the cost of the unit itself. Wow. Because this so, is all controlled by computer, and you need software, therefore. Right. And so every but, that, but that's just, you just have to buy that license one time, or do you need to for buy it? For every unit you buy. It has to be for every unit. It's just like Photoshop. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly well, right. Are, now, what, there are discounts for multiple licenses. Oh, good. But, but, right. What do we expect the learning curve to be? Are, are these guys going to have this figured out come Daytona, or are we going to be watching the first six, seven, eight races, them toying with this figuring it out? I, I, I think there are a lot of things that they're going to spend time figuring out. I, I think the actual laps around the racetrack is not as significant as on and off pit road. What happens when you run out of fuel? Yep. You know, how quickly does it, you know, can you reboot the fuel system? And so, so I, I think questions like that still have to yeah, be Yeah, what answered. if your computer locks up? <laughs> right, You're right. kind of screwed, aren't you? Well, yeah. it, the, the record, the failure rate on these units is nil. I mean, that's one, that's why they only have one of them, as opposed to the two ignition boxes that, are normally on um, on the car because they don't even feel that there's a need for a redundant system at this point. So, how about durability, engine durability? Does that does it have any effect at all in how the engine performs over a five six hundred mile race? Well, they are saying, and and, and they made a, a joke with Doug Gates yesterday, who's the uh, chief engine builder for Roush Yates Engines, um, that you know now. Uh, you can per perhaps use um, one of these engines for two 500-mile races. And he goes, yeah, right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> whether they can and whether they will are yeah. two entirely different things. Not, not if you're a big, heavily funded team. I think right. you're going to have the, still the one engine, one race rule in, uh, in Sprint Cup racing, at least, not in the lower series. But. All right. Well, we'll see what happens when we get fuel injection next year, the 2012 season, is when it arrives in NASCAR, in NASCAR for Reed Spencer and Buzz Cutler. I'm Bass Masters. We'll see you next time. Rowdy.com. Say it like it is. Say what like it is. Rowdy.com.